I want you also to find St. Mark chapter 9. It is where I'm going to use this familiar passage of scripture in which I want to cement in your heart in this Christian journey that we're in, it's all about him. When I ask you to find Ephesians chapter 1, it's because this is one of the most, in my opinion, profound letters along with Galatians that the Apostle Paul penned. It was interesting where he wrote them from because although he was in prison, he was free. He was in circumstances not so pleasant, but the circumstances didn't have him to the point that he's writing encouragement to the churches. As he was praying for the Ephesian church, one thing that I received from this particular letter that I had not seen before. And when he said in verses 17 and 18, as he's praying for the church, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, when Paul is pinning this, the most important, or one of the most important things that we must recognize in, that in this particular letter, he used the phrase, in Christ, in the beloved, 40 times. Throughout his entire 13 letters, he uses those phrases over a hundred times. And 40 times. So he is saying to the Christian, he is saying to the saint, the key of, of, of life is in this. We must be in him. That what he's about to expound upon and everything that the Bible teaches won't work for us unless. We're in him. And being in him means we're just not in the church. We have to understand what it means to be in him. That when Jesus got up, we have to distinguish, distinguish between what is pre-cross and what is post-cross. Because when he got up, Paul is saying he got up with everything. He got up with our salvation. He got up with no more condemnation. He got up with everything that was needed for our inheritance that we can live a life that will bring glory and honor to Christ. But none of it works if we're not in him. And Paul now Show I found out through his word, just because of the phrase in Christ, that God has a way that he can reveal to you, becomes revelation knowledge, what it means to be in him. It must be revealed to us, he said, according to the knowledge that we have learned. Not just the Logos or the word that we read. But now that I'm reading this word, being in him means what knowledge I have, the Logos of the word, that God can reveal to you 
the rhema of the word. I now know what it means to be in Christ. The word becomes alive. And every inheritance that's coming to me, because now this is not just something I'm reading. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. So being in Christ means coming alive based upon the knowledge that I have of him. I now am going to not only just hear I'm going to know and understand what it means to be in him. That's why Paul says, that I may know him. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. That when he got up, everything that he got up in, I got. But I got to understand, he says, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. That other words, some things that I didn't be see before, I now see. The eyes of my understanding. So when I understand what is happening, understanding gives directions. I said something right there. The eyes of your understanding that now I'm going to see some things that I never ever saw before. I'm going to see maybe why I've been asking God to do something for me, to deliver me, to heal me, to set me free, but it hasn't happened. If it hasn't happened, something I might not see, I now is going to be revealed to me. Oh, are y'all listening to what I'm saying? I'm going to free a couple of folks because God freed me. You see, I just had some cataracts removed. And I told my son-in-law, I'm surprised at how bright things are. I was seeing all right before but that haze is gone, and I now see what I didn't see. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. And what I have used for this particular teaching is St. Mark chapter 9. And I want you to turn there because this is a story, and in this story, I wanted to use something that's familiar to you. Oh, bless his name. I won't, for the sake of time, read all the scriptures, but it goes from verse 14 through 21. I want to point out, and then I'm going to back up, verse 26. And in verse 26, and the Spirit cried out and rent him sore and came out of him. As you all know, here is a demonic boy brought by his father to the disciples, the church to be, and Christ is present. They had taken, he had taken the boy to Christ or to the, the disciples. And they tried to do what they thought they needed to do, but it didn't work. So here is this man who had to believe what he heard about Christ because that's why he's there. Because you see, when your children are sick, all the parents know, you just can't quite get it together and feel like you want to feel when your children are sick. This boy is not only sick, he is possessed with a demonic spirit that took control, has control of his actions. And Jesus does what Jesus does. It's like Forrest Gump. Stupid is what stupid does. Hear this boy now. Demonic feel. Jesus 
does what Jesus does. And the spirit cried and came out. And when the spirit cried and came out, the boy fell and the folks thought the boy was dead. Because just before, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but just before Jesus does something miraculous, it'll oftentimes look worse than it did before. Uh, somebody needs to know this is the devil's Custer last stand on what he has been holding over you for a long time. And when he knows it's about over, he wants to do everything because he's tried everything and everything has failed because it's all about him. Can I go on church? Oh, bless his name. Verse 27 says it this way. But Jesus, because he's out, took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. You see, it's one thing we need to understand when it comes to receiving what is ours inheritance-wise from the Lord. Your position is, is as important as what you want Jesus to do. Here, here's what I mean. We want him to deal with our conditions. But you got to get yourself in a position before he deals with the condition. Where you even worship is important. It's just not another church because revelation knowledge will tell somebody this morning, this is where I ought to be. Instinctively, I know it in my spirit, but I don't want to deal with some circumstances of explaining this, explaining that to other folk. <laughs> But you see, where you bless the Lord, where you are fed, is just as important for what you are asking God to do in your life. I'm not trying to cause in your, any, any problems for you. I'm just simply saying this. When Jesus took his time to heal his friend Lazarus, <laughs> And he didn't heal him in the time frame that the sisters thought he ought to come. And our Savior went to see some girls with an attitude because they knew what he could do. They knew if he had just showed up when we called him, everything would be, would be all right. But Jesus is about to reveal something to them that they didn't know before. So when he gets to where, I'm feeling pretty good already. When he gets to where Lazarus is, because he asked him the question, where have you laid him? I mean, what have, where did you lose that I wasn't coming? <laughs> and you put a rock in front of it. The rock that you put in front of it, you're going to see. I'm going to have some angels sit on that rock. That rock is not going to keep me from doing what I know I came to do. But here's my point, Bishop. He says, Lazarus, come forth. So Lazarus comes forth. He's changing Lazarus position. He's getting him out of the grave and going to get him into God's grace. He says, Lazarus, come forth. Now, Jesus, I've done what I've done, but here come Lazarus. He then looks to the church and says, loose him and let him go. In other words, 
It's now love corner responsibility now that I have whew, changed his position. He is now ready for to be moved upon to deal with your condition. Can you give God a hand of praise? <laughs> Now, I'm going to tell you something about folk. I've learned you love corner. You love corner saying, help the distress, comfort the confused, but don't make friends where around people where you're not receiving encouragement. I did, you pray for them, you help them, but you see, I got to be in a church that when I leave out of there, I've been uplifted. We catch too much out there to be trying to catch something in here. No, no, no. You check your attitude at the door, and when you see me, let me see them teeth. You speak to me. You smile to me. You let me know I'm in love corner. Because when Christ got up, do you, but I think I said it, but you know why Christ said, Christ said, Father, forgive them, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Because you see, Jesus is now going to let us know. I got to get up and there can't be anything on me that's going to keep me down. So you forgive those folks, Lord, because I'm not letting unforgiveness ooh, shortchange my inheritance. I want to get up free. Ooh, hallelujah. So I'm telling somebody now, you forgive them, which means you lose them. It's time for you to stop letting folk that you don't even like control you that much. It changes your opinion. Oh, yes, yes. Woo, hallelujah. Woo. Back to verse 22. I'm, I'm moving right along, Deacon Joe. I'm moving right along. Look, he said, Hey, I'm so glad you're here, Mother God. I want you to hear this one. He says it this way. Go back to verse 22. Jesus saith unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Okay. Bishop, hang on. I know you already, I know you, this is for the guest. You all already go here. I'm just going to confirm what Bishop has been saying. All right. But I want you, even if this sounds a little odd, put it in the balcony, and whatever is right, God will bring it unto you. He says now, because of what the disciples couldn't do. He didn't put them on blast street in front of everybody, but they wanted to know, well, we're doing the, we saying the right thing, why couldn't we? Do that. He said, bring him to me. Bring him to me. I want all the folk and you the daddy. Daddy, you brought him here because you believed that they, me, could help him. You see, so he said, bring him to me. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Bishop, 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 for 40 years of ministry, you know, having, I felt that the whole weight of my believing now, having faith in God, is now upon me. If I just can't believe, when I looked that word belief, believe up. And I went back to the original way it was written in the Greek. 
St. Mark, the word believe is not there. The translators put it in to help us try to grasp having faith. But what it did, Bishop, it put a cataract over my eyes. Yes, I believe in Jesus. That's why I'm here. But he said, read it the way I originally said it. And the way that it was originally written is Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him that believeth. Because he had just said to, to them prior to this, oh, faithless generation. <laughs> Who is quiet? <laughs> I got their attention. He says, if you can, that word believe is not there. So then, who is the one who believes? Who is the one that faith never wavers? Who is the one that never doubts? Who is the one that never hesitates? Whose faith is always strong. It is our faith. When it comes to our faith, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm all over the place. Oh, I'm the only one of all these hundreds of folk. You see, I go to church, I hear something, and I'm revved up. I, I'm believing God for that. I leave the church, and what I start to see starts to eke away at my faith. And I find myself, uh, uh, hang with me, church. Mister, don't let him get me yet till I finish. I, I believe God for this, but then it doesn't happen. It's not coming to pass. And I feel myself just wondering, doubting. Not disbelieving in Christ. I just don't feel like I got enough on the inside. So you know what I do? I pray harder. And I do something that I don't ever want to do. And I'm so glad I start to fast. You mean I can't eat. I, but I got to get my faith up. Because this thing is pressing me. Uh, to 2000 and. 14, 15, I had prostate cancer. I had, I had, I had, I had. When I had the symptoms, before the doctor ever said anything to me, Bishop, I'm going to be Mr. Bishop, Pastor. No, this is Chester Trail. I walked in there. I, I had built myself up because I kind of had an idea what are you about to say? But I'm ready. Bring it on, Doc. I'm ready. <laughs> well, Mr. Trail, it is cancer. <laughs> you all went around, but I, I thought, oh, my goodness. Because you know what that word brings to the mind and to the heart. Uh, look, we're going to be, listen. We can be phony while we're eating dinner. We're going to be real up in here this morning, all right? Whew. I didn't want to tell my wife uh, it's confirmed. It's prostate cancer. Because I'm, you know, I'm doing us all this. Just say it. I mean, you know how we do I mean, just say it. Say, you say it and believe it. But when he said that, I'm all over the, the place. And for years, brothers, I would beat my own self up, trying to get up enough faith to not doubt at all until the Lord said to me, the believing is not altogether on you. 
What you have to have is faith in him that never doubts. Faith in him that always believes. <laughs> and so now, even though I'm totally clear, whatever comes and it kind of rocks me back, I don't beat myself up because my faith is not on my faith. My faith is on who? him <laughs> that has never failed. Sis, he's never failed. And I know what the church is doing. I know what your husband is doing. And I know what you're doing. And we do all of that. But your faith is in him. So you take what you have, believing in him, and say, Lord, I might want to check out of here. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stand strong because of the faith that I have in you. Can you all give God a hand of praise? <sighs> uh, this is Jesus' faith. I'm almost finished. Who never doubt. I know what some of you all are thinking, but I'm, I'm going to cover you in a minute. The New Living Translation reads like this. If this is Jesus talking to the man, it says it this way. What do you mean if I can? <laughs> what do you mean if I can? Jesus is saying, there's no doubt I can. You just believe I can. <laughs> oh, y'all missed that one. Jesus said, you should never doubt. I know you're going to have doubts, but just don't doubt me. <sighs> I tell him at home that when I want to give you something new, it's like feeding a baby. You know how they, they want the baby to birth? Because if the baby births, they're ready for some, something else good. So would you all just burp, giving God a hand of praise? Can, can you give him a... <laughs> <laughs> so as I go on to my last point, all things are possible to him with Jesus is saying, it's all about me. You all have been thinking it's all about you building yours. No, you put it on me and watch me build you. It's all about him. So when it comes to our position, even in the church, and what the church wants to do, it's all about him. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, sir. That's that. Can I move on now? I don't know. Y'all kind of quiet on me here. This. All things are possible to him, to the one that believes. Jesus said, I'm the one. I'm the one that believes. When it comes to faith, I know this, I, 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 I feel you. You have a little problem with this one. I feel you. When it comes to faith, only two times did Jesus use the word great faith. And both times, they were connected to a Canaanite sister and a centurion soldier. <laughs> he said, oh, great faith to a, to a, we would call a non-believer. Hadn't spoken anybody's tongues. <laughs> he said, you mean you believe all I have to do is speak the word? And your servant will be, here, will be here. Yeah, you only have to come. It's all about you. It's all about you. Oh, bless his name. Are, are you getting what I'm saying? It's all about him. Get your mind so much of all of you having all this great faith, but put what you have on him. 
and the Canaanite woman that had the little girl. Well, can you imagine him talking about her having great faith and he just called her a doll? But you see, she knew it was about him. So she said, you know, truth, Lord, but even the dogs <laughs> can, get a, can get something uh, uh, from the master. So back then when she was making reference to that, she was talking about, and they had what they call lap dogs. And the master that had the lap dogs, sometimes the dog would be under the table, but other times the dog would be sitting on the master's lap. I'm not going to lap dog. So the dog was in a position <laughs> under the table. I don't have to have it all, but if I can just... Woo, church! Uh, she said, if I can just get a crumb, I don't want the whole loaf because you just told me that cake wasn't baked for me. But if I get a crumb and I test the ingredients in the crumb, everything that's in the cake was in the crumb. So I just want to position myself. Woo! <laughs> Ooh, church, I'm about finished. I, who is the one in the text that's really believing? It wasn't the father. It wasn't the disciples. They had their problem. Jesus is the only one that said, I have no doubt. So don't you doubt. So, mother, this is what I realized I must do in situations like this. Paul taught them casting down vain imaginations against the knowledge of God that will come up in high places. Well, the highest places that can come up in my mind. So now I can see why I've been believing but not receiving because pictures paint words. And whatever I want that is of the will of God, I've got to have an imagination that I see what I want before I see what I wanted. It, in other words, in my mind is the womb of imagination. That word, when, when, when Isaiah in 26 and 3 says, he'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Well, that word mind was the word Y-E-S-T-E-R, and it was translated 12 times imagination. So he is saying, for us to have a birth, we have to have a conception. And the conception that we have is in our mind. And if I can see it in my mind, who oh, oh, bless his name, if I can see it, sis, I want you to start seeing you up out of that chair because I yeah, see it's the will of God so you have to start seeing her all over this church like she used to be <laughs> Woo! and Paul is saying if you can conceive it in your spirit and all of you do this all of you do this watch how I show you, you all do it. You have been talking to some people on a given subject, and they'll say something. The words that they say will cause you to say, oh, I can't see that. I don't see that. What you're saying is, what you said, I can't see it. 
you also have said to a folk, well, I see that. Well, I see that. That's why life and death is in the power of the tongue. So I have to give life-giving words that I start to see a picture of what I'm about to come into. I've conceived it in my spirit. Now it's coming up out of me and it's going to be manifested. What I must do is hold on while the birthing process is going on because my faith is not in my day to day. My faith is in Christ Jesus. My faith is saying, yes, he is going to be, bring it to pass. I can see it. I can see it. I can see it. Would you all mind taking another burp? <laughs> Jesus, Woo. are y'all just quiet because you're listening? Jesus had faith. Listen to what he did say. That what he did at the cross will supply us with everything that we need. Now, he said, when it comes to what the grace of God got me up, I don't know how many times or how many years I was working to live better. I mean, I wanted to be an example of what I'm teaching. So I would work, especially when you were around, on my actions. I can't even get them to smile at me this morning. <laughs> oh, I worked at holiness. I worked at that. Ah, I quit cussing. <laughs> I even, oh, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anymore. Y'all all are too interested in that. I'm not telling you anymore. But I worked at that thing. I worked at that thing. Look at, look at how some of the saints worked at not dressing a saint way because they wanted to look holy and as evil as you could be. Just, I mean, just working at it, working at it. But then when I realized when he got up, you all won't like this, but when he got up and now that I'm in him, I'm in a perfect position. Now, you might know what you might know, but my holiness is not predicated on me, but receiving him who is holy. You ought to know this didn't stop them, but this will. It's not the laws that we were taught that will stop our actions. What will change our actions is understanding how much God really loves us. The grace of God will constrain. And I tell you what, when you want to change somebody's actions towards you, start loving them in such a way that they realize how much you love them and they will start treating you differently. Ooh, are y'all hearing what I'm saying, church? So when it comes to what he did when he got up, now I got, we got to work, but we don't have to work on being saved. <laughs> it's done. We don't have to work on being ashamed. He took it. Bishop, can I say this? I want to say this. You see, for years when I was preaching, because, you know, we, we would say, uh, if you want to stop, you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And we, and we should. But Jesus did something to a woman that never, she never spoke in tongues. He never drowned her in oil. All she did was when she got up and walked away completely free. And that was the woman that was caught in adultery. 
I mean, he talked to that sister and just talked to that sister. But this is what got me, Bishop. This is what used to tie me up. Because he said to her, go. Y'all know the scripture. (laughs) Go and sin no more. My brother, how can he tell her to do that? Go and sin no more. You know what he did? He lifted condemnation. (laughs) When the church lifts condemnation from folk and let them know all that you were, all that you done is under the blood and you realize that you are free. It's that freedom and the love for the one that freed you that when Bubba hit on her again, she said, not today. He's brought me too far. Oh, can (laughs) y'all Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, church? Stop being ashamed of yourself. He took the shame. Stop feeling guilty about what you did. He paid the price. Thank you, Jesus. And since he died for me, paid all of that. You know know what the word salvation means? Yeah, I know you do. Sozo, S-O-Z-O. You know what it means? Too good to be true. That's why we still working to be saved. We think, how in the world? You mean all I have to do is believe on him? Yep. Well, what about my lipstick? What about it? What about where I'm going? What about it? So the church, instead of teaching the love of God, we brought you right back into bondage, telling what you could do, couldn't do. But Jesus is saying, I will put a teacher on the inside of you that will lead and guide you into all truth. And I'm the truth. And whom the Son has set free, whoo, is free indeed. (laughs) I'm sitting down, mother. I'm sitting down, I'm sitting down. Whoo, hallelujah. So Lord, I don't know who I'm preaching, that ought to help somebody. I don't care what you bring up about my past. (laughs) I don't care. That's on you. I'm free. And you no longer are going to have the ability to make me feel guilty because Jesus took the guilt. He took the guilt. I'm just going to jump to the end for time's sake because I don't want to wear mother out. So let's stop struggling to please God, but rest in him. He would tell you, labor. Now, here's the work. You labor to enter into that rest. In other words, anything that comes against me in my mind, coming against the knowledge of God in that high place, I'm going to work. I'm, no, I'm going to rest in his promises. His promise said I'm healed. His promise said I'm delivered. I'm going to paint a picture in my own mind that whatever you bring, devil, I got something for you. I got the word of God down on the inside of me and my faith is going to be in him. Can y'all give me one more burp? (laughs) Okay. I know some are saying when it comes to this faith, if you, let me just tell you, and for the sake of time, won't go through it. But I had Acts chapter, I think it was chapter three. I had Acts, I'm gonna show you, Bishop, how uh, I thought of one thing and the Lord revealed, this is a blind man sitting out in front of Lund Corner every Sunday, and we walking past him because we're coming into the sanctuary. Now, this man had been taught a subculture. He said, now, see those folks? Devil said, see those folks going in there? By and large, they're some good folk. That's where you need to beg because, see, they're gullible. 
and they'll give you some change. So we're going to sit you here every day where you can beg. Well, here comes two of the apostles. But this day, they left their change at home. In other words, don't come to church without any change. But these two apostles this day came with no change. But he said something that, again, was revel it, 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 it was revelation to me. Peter looked on the man and said, look on us. Bishop, I, I would preach that, and I get to a good part. And I would say, we have to live in such a way that when folks look at us, they see Jesus. Now, and I, I would concentrate, I was concentrating my point on, on how we were doing. We should be an example of what we are teaching and believing. Huh? But I found out this. What God wants to do through me is not based upon the holiness of me because he can use anything and anybody at any time when he wants to bless somebody. So when I said this before, I got challenged. But I went back to what Peter said. Just one verse. If you all, you still got your Bible. If you all would, if you all would look at verse 16 because they got the man up and I know the man told the church up because he went in there doing something they weren't accustomed to worshiping and praising God he got all their attention then Peter now is going to use this opportunity to get his point across he says it this way and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom ye see and ye know, yea, the faith which is by him, giving him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Peter was saying, don't think I could do that. Don't think it's all because of me and John. No. If you noticed, I had faith in his name. My faith is in what he can do. Oh, y'all missed it again. It's all about him. I, I, I'm sitting down. Now, this is a preacher sitting down. So it, it, it's this time, because mother, the woman with the issue of blood, because here's when I was talking to them. Here's where they came back on me. Jesus did say this. Thy faith has made me whole. I said, yes, yeah, her faith made her whole. But you notice her words. If I, she got a picture of him, of her <laughs> touching the hem of that garment. <laughs> she had faith in, but now she said, I, I done tried everything else, but now I can just see myself touching that gun. The reason Jesus says, Thy faith hath made you whole is because when you are obedient to his word, he takes your obedience and chalks it on your faith calendar. He says, Because of how you, an obey, how you obeyed me, your faith, your obedience to what I told you. Let me see. You remember the fishermen hadn't caught anything. Where's Butler? These guys were worse than Butler. Hadn't caught anything. I mean, not one fish hadn't caught anything. Jesus said, you cast on the other side. Deke, when they cast on the other side and got all of those fish, Jesus said, your faith has caused this outpouring. In other words, he said, you obey my word. You have faith in me and your, ability, your faith in me, I'm going to chalk it up as faith because you obeyed me. It's all about him. My last scripture, this is the most important one. 
my last scripture, Galatians 2. Galatians 2, verse 20. This is where I, this is where I tried to show these guys my gotcha moment. But I just loved it. Here's Paul saying, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I, but Christ liveth in me. Here we go. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by my faith. No, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and also gave himself for me. I'm not doing this myself. I'm living off of his faith. To the point he is saying, when you try to do this, I do not frustrate the grace of God. In other words, I'm not going to have God upset that what I'm trying to do is telling him what Christ has already done wasn't enough. I'm just going to believe all of it is by him. Now, y'all can shout because when I get my nose together, you know I'm about to run out. So you ought to get. <laughs> church, church, I'm telling you the truth. Church, I'm to the age, have been there for maybe, well, I'm in my 70s. I'm in my 70s. I'm in. My 70s. I'm in <laughs> and. Being 74, uh, I've been on Social Security <laughs> since 65. I think that's when you're 65, whenever it was. Uh, now, here's what I do. Every month, <laughs> on the 17th of the month, I get a Social Security check. I'm not embarrassed. You know why? I'm in the system. <laughs> I'm in the system. I'm not trying to get something I didn't put into. Now, some of you live off Social Security. You don't doubt that when that check is supposed to be there, it's there. You're living off of it. Thank God. That's how I'm treating Christ. I'm living off your faith. <laughs> because I checked the record. And when I checked the record, I found my name. And when I found my name, I got to know I got something coming. Woo! So I don't get distressed. I don't get worried. The 17th is there. I just called the bank. <laughs> yes. Automatic. Well, God is saying, the same way you're living off of that, why don't you live off my faith? That when that time comes that you need me, don't worry about how you're feeling. The very fact that you're in front of me, I know you got faith. But be like the man, Lord, I got faith, but not just help me with my unbelief. What do you say? If I need my healing, look on my back. <laughs> look on my back. You see those stripes? Just jump on those stripes. Will y'all just burp and give the Lord a hand of praise? I... Church, let me tell you. It is true. Every praise belongs to God. He has done it all. That's why I was watching this program and I was about to sit down. I was watching this program. The man walked out. It was like New York City or something. Had all these people around. Had these young folks with him. And he asked the question, where are my worshipers? They got, then he said, where are my praisers? Because here's what praise and worship does. 
it gets your attitude right so that when you go before God, he says, now that you come to me, right? Make your request known. What is it you need from me? What is it you want from me? And God has blessed us to be here this morning. And whatever he has done, every praise, every praise, every praise. Where are the worshipers? Every praise, every praise, every
in the name of Jesus wholeness Lord and Lord we gonna praise you now because we know what you are going to do because our faith is not in us our faith is in you so every praise you to know this. 
When I asked my sister to sing that song, uh, I almost let go, all right? Now, from the moment my wife got sick, I knew it was serious. No, you understand, I knew it was serious. I could tell the way they were working in the, in the operating room, and I mean, in the emergency room, it was serious. I could hear the, the fear in their voices. My sister said, you want me to call Dr. Jones? I said, call him. You want me to call Sister Christina Jones? I said, call him. I mean, because I knew it was serious. I'm, I'm a pretty, you know, private person. But I mean, if there's somebody that knows something I don't know, I need him to come and, and help us right now. You know what I mean? But, but God kept fear from me. You have to understand, it, it wasn't me because I'm, I, I'm not capable of that. God kept fear from me. Now, you have to understand this because, see, knowledge can mess you up. 40% of the folks that have what she had don't even make it to the hospital. Do you understand what I'm saying? For those that make it to the hospital, in two weeks, 75% of them don't make it. Are you all listening to me right now? They don't make it. We've been to the hospital with folks from this ministry that didn't make it to the hospital. Now watch this. After about two or three weeks, I mean, God was sustaining me. God was keeping me. And I was getting ready to go one night. My wife said, I don't want you to go yet. Now I'm on the day shift. I've been there 10, 12 hours. She said, I don't want you to go yet. So I'm saying, Pancho's there. I said, okay, I'm going to stay a couple more hours here. And I did, and she got sleep. She said, okay, you can go. Praise the Lord. I'll see you in the morning. But this is an interesting thing. As I was driving home, I got scared. I am telling you, as God is my witness, and by the time I got home, fear had overwhelmed me. And I remember walking into my house, there's nobody there, it's quiet. I walked into the kitchen. And when Bishop says it's not about me, it's about him, I knew. The scripture says, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. And I said, Lord, I don't want to walk in fear. I want to walk in faith. And as quickly as the words came out of my mouth, the Lord took that fear away from me. And once again, we began to walk by faith and not by sight. Not by what we can see. Thank the Lord for my family and how they stood. But let me share this to you. When we were getting ready for this service and I was looking back over him and the doctor, after he came back a month later, he said, it's going to take you about six months to get back. And then we had a couple setbacks. So we gave him a couple more months, but she's walking. Are you all listening? She's walking. But when I was thinking about this service in, 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 in alignment with what Bishop was saying, you got to be able to see it in your mind. You got to be able to see what he can do. And not what you can do, not by my might, not by my strength, but by his power, it will come to pass. And I thought about this, and I thought about this song that Kirk Carr wrote. And in that song he said, I almost gave up. I was right on the brink of a breakthrough, but I couldn't see it. The devil in that moment really had me. But Jesus, he came and grabbed me. And he held me close so I couldn't let go. So I'm telling you, we're here today because the Lord kept us. We're lying today only because of his grace. He kept us. He held us close so we wouldn't let go. Somebody give him praise and give him glory and give him honor. Now, I'm going to get her a chair so we can go down there and greet you. She's going to sit today, but in the days to come, she's going to dance. Now, I'm going to say this to you. I'm gonna, Sister Lauren comes from a dancing family. All right? Now, I'm going to say this to you. Where are the worshipers? Where are the praisers? Now, I'm going to say this. Don't you dare let my wife come back here and dance before you dance. Don't let her praise him before you praise him. Don't let her worship him before you worship him. I need somebody to perfect this house.